We're going to meet a lot of nice people, have a good time, and as always, you're invited to come on along with us as we continue our search together for, California, for California's gold. California, here I come, right back where I started from, where flowers of oh, flowers bloom in the sun. Each morning at dawn, a birdie sing, and everything a sun kissed miss said, Don't be late. That's why I can hardly wait. Open up that golden gate, California, here I come. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Huel's Gold. This is episode 19. And today, well, we're celebrating community celebrations. That's right. We sure are. And. I think we should be celebrating the fact that we get to see not one, but two parades that Huel jumps in the middle of. This is our ooble double. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing, really, that <laughs> he's allowed to do that. I don't know if he's allowed, but he certainly does do it plenty. He just does it, yeah. Do you know what else he does? I don't. Well, I do, but... Well, let's describe this walk. Yeah, like right off the bat, the cold open. Just like Vince McMahon. <laughs> Coming down to the <laughs> ring. <laughs> but instead of a Titan Tron, he has a dragon. Yeah. It's basically the... Uh, a, it's like a Chinese parade wrestling entrance. Mm -hmm. No chance. That's what they've got. <laughs> That dragon's got no chance. <laughs> so the first thing that we could talk about, I guess, here, well, is that shirt. Yeah, right off the bat also. Like, the walk, the dragon. It's really the combo. The shirt. It's a long sleeve. It's not a paisley design. It is like a patterned shirt, but the base color, mustard yellow. Yeah. And then the patterns, which we see more later, up close, when he's doing those mid-parade interviews... They're almost like little, uh, like, uh, Florida Lee yeah, design yeah. kind of things. Yeah, but well, he does. He definitely has a spectrum on this episode. Yeah, I'm going to refer yeah. to this as the loud side of the spectrum, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then he goes to the quiet right at the end. Well, speaking of loud, you heard the intro today, and those were not gunshots. No. It is part of this parade, which we'll tell you more about it, but it was just too funny hearing Huel get interrupted by loud firecrackers to not to not share with you. So but before we talk more about why this is all happening, we need Huel to tell us where we are this week. So Huel Just tell us. <laughs> The sky was filled with rain clouds as we crossed over the Yuba River and into the town of Marysville, a historic mining town 45 miles north of Sacramento in the heart of the Sacramento Valley. Now, we were in Marysville to attend what most historians agree is the oldest parade in California. But we pulled into town a day before the parade so we could spend a little extra time there finding out about its history. And when you talk about history in Marysville, you have to talk about the Chinese, who have been there since the 1850s. In fact, back in the 1800s, Marysville had the third largest Chinese community in the entire United States. Okay, so we're in Marysville. Or as we should say, Mary Moneyville. <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> This is so funny to me. I don't know why. The, the outline. You're looking at it right now. Yeah, yeah. It's the, the outline's fine. Yeah, yeah. The, the star is fine, and really everything is fine, except for one thing. Yeah. What is it? Marysville, spelled M A Y M A R Y S V I L L E. Unless you want to change the S <laughs> to a dollar sign. Why did they do this? Uh, so I was. <laughs> it's so funny. I don't know. I, it is funny, especially when you're just staring at it. Yeah. I have. I have a theory. Okay. They had a key, their keyboard. Mm -hmm. The S, the button was broken, 
So they were really trying to figure out how to fix this. Like, what can we do? It can't be Maryville. Yeah. So he said, ah, I know Huel said, maybe Louis said, I don't know. Hit sh- or, uh, shift. Uh, David Swafford. The maybe editor David Swafford. Episode? That's a better one. Yeah. yeah. Maybe he said, hey, I got an idea. Just hit shift plus four. There you go. <laughs> That's it's, that's the best I got. It's it's bizarre. Yeah. So, um, it really sets the tone for the episode because it's it's a it's an odd one. Because as you heard, we're in Marysville for the it's a there's a parade. It's a big a big Bakai uh, festival, right? Which is not to be confused. Which what I initially heard was Buckeye. Yeah. No. Very different. No. But we don't start at the museum, or we do start at the museum. <laughs> we don't start at the parade. We start at a museum. Well, it's a temple. Temple. It's, a water, it's a water temple. Yeah. Yeah. So in Marysville, according to the the person that's giving Huel the the tour there, which is Janice Nall, this temple is the only temple for Bakai. In the Northern Hemisphere. Are you sure it's not the Western? I don't think. <laughs> Janice knows. <laughs> because, okay, so Huel is pretty well known. Even Louis said it. For repeating things that people say. And especially in question form. So she says, yes, it's the only one in the Northern Hemisphere. This is the only temple in the Northern hem- Hemisphere? Yes, the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> instantly just <laughs> boofs it right off the bat. Oh, that's awesome. But other than that little hiccup, she's a good tour guide, didn't you think? I thought so. The f- there was a bit, though, when she walks in. Do you notice what Huel said as he was walking through? He's like, okay, we can we can you know go inside the temple. And he said, oh, gosh. <laughs> Into the temple? <laughs> I just... Like he was, didn't already go in there and set up all his shots. Right, but come oh, on. yeah, yeah. But they do go in the temple. She kind of shows him the, the doorway and has a little story with that. But Huel gets to be real Huel real quick. Which this is one of, well, yeah, I'll say it's my favorite thing about him. Mm-hmm. He's just handsy. Very. With the merchandise. Yeah. Hands off the merchandise. So the th- the first thing that he touches is this ceremonial sword that he sees after seeing this huge kind of display, this golden display with peacock feathers, and he just runs into frame like like a kid. Just oh, let me have the sword. And when he's holding it, the grin that he has on his face, yeah, dude, it's funny. And then he's like, oh, there, <laughs> there's cobwebs on it, trying to like. Call her out on the dirtiness, and she's like, "Oh, well, those are 112 years old." He's like, "Oh, uh, oh, uh. <laughs> that's." It reminded me of uh, you know Antiques Roadshow. Oh yeah, when people have the cobwebs or the dust, and they clean it off, and now it's worth you know half. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what if you destroyed the value of the ceremonial sword? So Huel kind of boosts the the cobwebs, but he really boosts <laughs> getting it back into its little holder because he just schlommies it. He's just like, oh, okay, well, the hunch, clunk. <laughs> and she he laughs. You'd think she'd be like, oh, no, you're hurting the sword. But she's just like, <laughs> laughing at his, behind his back. Oh, man. So, he will. Well, next we learn about a few, <laughs> a few, <laughs> a few of uh, these fortune games. Yeah. Well, games. Not games. Well, kind of. These they're destructive sort of, games they're yeah. playing? Yeah. So the first one was, I mean, you call I call them fortune sticks. Is that what she called them? Yeah. And then we got the slam sticks. The slam sticks. <laughs> <laughs> so the fortune sticks are these sticks in a cup. I think they're like, they look like chopsticks. And you like swirl them and one falls out and it's got a, a number on it. And Huel asks, okay, well, what's your fortune? She ignores him. Goes on to the next thing. And Huel has... He puts his stick uh, cup down and picks up the slam sticks, which at this point, we don't know they're slam sticks. At all. And no. he's got his pair, and he's 
clap, 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 clap. <laughs> and I, again, Janice is just kind of giggling at him. And then she shows what you do with them. And you just... You just shlami them, dude. You just throw them on the dang floor. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. And that this starts the running gag of the the parade interviews, which she says, oh, I asked if it was going to rain, and it said no. Because apparently it never rains at the Bakai parade. Except it does all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Because Huel gets to see... What was it? Oh, the dragon? Yeah, it's the first dragon. Or the oldest dragon. Um, well, I guess technically it's the first dragon in the United States. That was brought from China. From China. That okay. was made explicit. Yeah. It was in the mid-19th century. Okay. So this is Moon Long. I'm going to give it its, I guess its English translation, mm-hmm. which is Dancing Dragon. Yeah. But as Huel notices, or makes note... It ain't dancing no more. No. Because it's just the head, the jaw, and part of the tail that's left. Yeah. Which really, I mean, this thing being from the mid-1800s, it's in pretty good shape. Being made of paper mache. Yeah. Because she makes clear it's not the same kind that we think of if you're, like, you know, making a a, a thing for school or something. I wish we could ask Huel because he touches it. A lot of times, to, yeah. To, to see what it's... Like... He touches the mouth, the teeth, the eyes, the horns, everything. Yeah. It's always oh, touching the nose too. Like, oh, she. Oh well, she's touching it too. So I yeah. guess that's it's okay. It's fair game. But this is a nice segue that Huel has because we're seeing the first dragon, and now we're go- going to the parade where we see the newest dragons. But. Before we get to the dragons, the, we're at the beginning of the parade here. The, this is literally the parade starting. And there's the man who leads the procession and Huel. And he does a little interview before the parade even starts. He stopped the whole thing. And the dude he's interviewing doesn't have much to say. He just lights these firecrackers that have the lightest or the smallest fuse right. of all time. Maybe he was concentrating on throwing these firecrackers because he'll light it in less than a half second, or that's a little longer than this, but about a second later. Like, like smash, bam! bam. <laughs> like, smash, bam! <laughs> so, Huel starts his interviews with him, then he moves on to the gong player, who <laughs> he kind of calls out for wearing earplugs, but he's a gong player. So, yeah. A little loud. Did, did you notice what's going on with the gong cart? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, this gong, it's more of a rickshaw. Yeah. It's like a... And who's towing it? None other than a scout. Are they scouts now? They're boy scouts back then. Yeah, yeah. Scouts these been days. He could have been an eagle. He could have been he's an eagle. Tall. That's he true. looks like he's older. But them shorts. He's, he's got them short shorts. <laughs> Um, it is, but they had to like get this scout to pull the rickshaw gong. It's just, it's just, it's just funny. It's just funny. But then Huel's kind of just like slam bashing through the floats. Cause there's lots of different kinds. Slam bashing? Slam bashing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then the one he decides to stop on, which I got to just, I got to just play it. He's going to describe it, and then you're just going to hear the silliness that lasts for way too long. Just listen to this. And of course, there were dragons. Little dragons and big dragons. And there were monkeys, too. (laughs) So, since this is just audio, this is a float... A yellow flowery fo- float with a bunch of kids in monkey costumes, which really they look like they're chimpanzee costumes. So really, they're primate costumes. Get your biology right, Huel. But either way, <laughs> the ooh ooh ah ahs for I can look on it right here happens for 
13 seconds, which <laughs> doesn't sound like a lot. Really, it's not a lot until that last round of ooh, ooh ah, ahs come yeah. in. <laughs> and Huel, you can tell that they cut it short because Huel is following along with them. And they oh, he's smiling. He's laughing. He's loving it. You can tell that the, uh, David Swafford, the editor, was probably like, okay, just like one ooh, ooh. He's like, no, no, they do it a bunch. Just throw them all in. He's like, uh, maybe half. Whatever, Dave. <laughs> but is that kind of it on the... Oh, no, there's the um, the tail interview that he does. Oh, yes, yes. Well, he talks to some more people on the side, mostly about the rain. There's a group of ladies that first set the precedent for the it never rains here. Oh, well, it sprinkled last year. But she's still a believer, she says. That's not how it works. <laughs> well, how about the guy behind this group of people? Do you notice him creeping? <laughs> the like younger kid in the Milwaukee Brewers hat? <laughs> yeah. He's like pointing at the hat, it looks like. Is that what he's doing? It looks like it. Like, hey, bro, Brewers the best, bro. <laughs> Whatever. Oh. But after them, he goes to a lady... Oh, well, it's not raining. Why you got this umbrella? Oh, well, for the sun? Well, it doesn't rain, right? Nope, never rains. Well, except for last year. Exactly. And then she, he goes to the next lady over. But before we go over to that lady... You weren't, you weren't sure about this, right? Yeah, yeah. This guy? There's a guy in the background who's kind of like telling a story to someone next to him. And he's talking with his hands a lot. And then he stops, looks dead in the camera... And he kind of does this like hand motion that at first glance, you thought it was the proverbial middle finger. I thought he was, I think he was letting the birds fly. It's his thumb. Like we had to slow-mo it and check like, no, he's doing some sort of like upward thumb motion. Like which, the volume up kind of thing. Turn it I turn up, the monitors bro. up. I can't hear myself. Hey, can you hear me in the back? <laughs> bro, turn it up. <laughs> yeah. So he's also wearing a vest. Uh, on a cowboy hat too and a cowboy hat with like is that like it's like the kind of uh, cowboy hat that a a park ranger would wear with a little golden tassel on the front kind of a thing but then the lady after him after the first lady actually kind of says well it has rained a couple times so what like don't say that right it's just a flat out lie now. Which Huel's investigative journalism kind of... He's like, well, there's a big difference between never rains and sometimes rains. <laughs> and then she changes her tone. Well, yeah, it does sometimes. In the next bit, do we get to see Tom Sawyer or a Monkey King? Well, according to the guy being interviewed, they're one and the same. <laughs> because at this time of year, I guess it's the year of the monkey which 1992 was, I guess. And he's talking about the king, the monkey king and his friend, Mr. Pig, and how they are like uh, folk tales in China. They're pretty much the same as Tom Sawyer. <laughs> uh, we both looked at each other. <laughs> like that. To, you look at, we got to, th- okay, this is going to be, have to be one of those that we throw up on Instagram because Tom Sawyer, this is not. I mean, I know he, we shouldn't be so literal about this, but... No, but it looks like, you know, in The in the Little Rascals, when they go get, get a loan from the bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I get it. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then we we pop on over to the, the last dragon we see. And this is where Huell's parade interview really kind of... It's next level. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Rewind it. Rewind it. Stop the presses. I think something crazy happened and we missed it before. So play it again. So what just happened there? Oh, no, no. That's not what it was. I thought I thought the pig man, you Mr. He, pig. Yeah, you got ran over? Yeah, yeah. It looks like he just le- he just knelt down but near a truck. But where is he at? When the camera pans back over, he's not there. He time traveled or he something. Did. He I did. don't know. 
Just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Pigman's okay. He was behind the Monkey King. But then we go to this long dragon. We hear uh, one of the ladies in charge of the dragon talk about how long it is. And then the tail comes up and Huel just... <laughs> he just runs after the guy. And he's trying, what's it like being on the tail? And he's just <laughs> The like, guy's just like waving. Uh, get out of the way, dude. Oh, man. It was almost like he was running after a conga line. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. You need one more. I love oh, dance. So how, how how does it feel to be the t- tail of a dragon? <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh man! But that's the that's the end of the first community celebration, and it's time we head back down south, pretty far down south. Mm-hmm. Huel, where are we going? Our next stop takes us to Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Feeney's front yard in Sierra Madre, a pleasant little town in the San Gabriel Valley, about 15 miles from downtown L.A. When we got there, I think just about the whole town was already there. To take an up-close and personal look at their town's pride and joy. It all started innocently enough back in 1894 when Mrs. William Brugman planted a 75-cent seedling out by our front porch, a wisteria vine to be exact, something to add a little color to the yard. Well, not only did it add color, it ended up growing so large it completely engulfed and collapsed the Brugman house. And today, even though that original house is long gone, the vine is still alive and growing. Now, I'm not sure exactly how much area it covers these days, but let's just say this is a healthy vine, a vine that over the years has helped put the town of Sierra Madre on the map and in the record books. It's a town landmark that's known all over the world. And one day a year, usually toward the end of March, the two families whose homes and yards it now covers invite people to drop by for a close-up look and a smell of the famous vine. Sierra Madre. All right, so the Mother Mountain Range. Yeah. That's where we are. And we're here to see a big old bush. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. So as you heard, this is one giant vine. A wisteria vine. A wisteria vine. And at first, I thought that the house that it originally grew on was underneath it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess it's gone. Now there's two other houses underneath it. Yeah. So it didn't eat the original house. No. But the people who own the houses now allow the city to put on these tours once a year. And, well, I, sh- I should say it about the the prior event and this event. Uh, the the Marysville Parade and this Wisteria Fest both still happen. Both happened this past March. We missed them, but they, they happen every March. So these are still active things. Okay. They go on, which is cool because you know how that goes with this these early episodes. Right. Sometimes these things are gone. or Well, the devastating news about the... The Roy Rogers Museum. Yeah, that was... Not the Will, Ro- Will Rogers Museum. No. Which is located in... Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Branson, Missouri. Um, so Huel's interviewing some people there. And one of the first ones is... Sisters, right? That's what I would have guessed. It's these two elderly women, both with very light, like gray hair, glasses. They look like they're the same age, but apparently it's a mother-daughter. And... One of them's been waiting 60 years to see this vine. You know, there are places I want to go my whole life. Like, I want to go to Yellowstone. I want to go to uh, Italy. Yeah. And the vine. <laughs> no, I'm not. Well, don't want to downplay the vine. But No, but is... Th- this is the thing. I think that these are sisters and or friends who wanted to play a joke on you. <laughs> I never even thought of that, but that would be good. Cause you know, this is still a point in time when Huel is not that well known. 
at least not as well known as he would be. So they just see this camera guy and this this microphone guy. Like, oh, this is my mother. You think it was the first lady playing a joke on the other lady? Oh, like... Like an so, age joke? So the first lady is the mother? <laughs> no, no, just like they're friends or something. And just like, oh, this is my mother. And she's just like, uh, yeah. what? <laughs> I like that. Oh, man. But after her, there's a few more interviews. There's a lady who seems to be obsessed with the color purple, which I guess this is the right place to go because you're uh, completely uh, enveloped in purple flowers, which it is pretty crazy that there, this vine is this big. And Louis does a good job of getting like big shots that show. Yeah, like the sun it. peering mm-hmm. through it. Yeah. yeah. And then we get to meet... The owners of the two houses that are currently underneath it. First one is Nell Solt. Which, cool name. Mm-hmm. N-E-L-L-E-S-O-L-T. So, this is the thing about... You can read her name on the screen. Mm-hmm. And right underneath her name is one of my favorite descriptions of the person. Or yeah, just... Normally, why, this is like a person's uh, like occupation. Right. No, it just says it's, it, it, <laughs> it's in her yard. <laughs> so that's that's so weird. I know. And also, this is a good time to bring up the uh, the kind of the graphic design in general of California's gold, but specifically the uh, the type that they use because they use different typefaces all the time. They're all generally the same. But one thing that's always happening is there is a gigantic... It's a drop shadow, right? That effect? Yeah. It's like the longest, thickest, biggest, darkest one. (laughs) And it's... Well, they wanted it to pop. I guess so. It does pop. Uh, And we get to see it again when we hear from the other owner. And her name is Maria Feeney. Which... The neighbors are the Salts and not the Matthews. Yes. Uh, this, I always thought that Mr. Feeney never married, but maybe this is just his sister. Maybe he's an estranged. Maybe. But we get to know that it's in her yard, too. Yeah. Maria Feeney, it's in her yard, too. So did you notice that Maria Feeney got an exclamation point? And no comma between yard and two. And but. a space between the last O and the exclamation point. <laughs> so uh, that's the style. Yeah, um, I like it. So, did you notice that one of the two houses, maybe Maria Sweeney, she's got a pool underneath this thing? Let's hear it. You're a pool master. Uh, that is a nightmare. Come on, why? Because you're under a canopy of leaves and flowers. Twigs. What I mean, what can you do? To can you prevent this at all? Do you have a pool cover? What do you what do you have, what are you supposed to have? What's the point of having a pool if you gotta keep it covered all the time? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's fine. Do whatever I, you I'm want. O- I'm over it. Do whatever you want. All I know is that we're out of here. And we're heading east to a town that Alan knows nothing about. Nothing. So, Huel, take us over there, big dog. <laughs> Our last stop takes us to the town of Redlands, about 60 miles due east of Los Angeles in San Bernardino County. Now, Redlands is quite a community, boasting its own University of Redlands, founded in 1907. It's a city proud of its culture, its traditions, and its history. And there are a lot of neat old buildings around town. Buildings like the old post office, which is on the National Register of Historic Places. The old Santa Fe train station, which has been restored. The Morey House, built back in 1890 and a real gem. And the Kimberly Crest House and Gardens, which epitomizes a beautiful turn-of-the-century home. There's also the newly restored and expanded A.K. Smiley Public Library, which everyone in town is proud of. But we were in Redlands to visit a unique building that's located behind the public library. 
nothing else like it in the entire country, and attend a very special celebration that's connected with that building. And the whole thing started off, you guessed it, with a parade. So, I'm not going to lie to you, I lived here. You did. <laughs> <laughs> For how long? A, uh, nine months. Nine months. Okay, so not like a full live. Like a live. You moved. Did you move all your stuff there? Uh, I mean, it was a two-bedroom apartment with five guys. <sighs> it's borderline, but... Yeah, I got my car stolen. That was cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we refer to this as... Well, it goes by Redlands, Red Zone, Shredlands, <laughs> Shred Zone... <laughs> These are the names we gave to it because we were skateboarding a lot. Mm -hmm. And as anyone knows, when you skateboard, you shred. Yeah. So So, one of the places, was it the the train station you said you hung out in? Yeah. We used to walk the tracks. Okay. Because there's the Krikorian Theater. Well, no, that's kind of by downtown. Mm -hmm. Uh, For whatever reason, this is where I figured out at that Chipotle, if you used to get rice and meat, it used to be three items would constitute a burrito. And so they would charge me two dollars for essentially a steak and rice burrito. Well, that deal's gone. Ugh. You, you kidding me, dude? <laughs> no. I used to buy two <laughs> for four dollars. It's like four thirty or whatever the taxes were. It seems like the kind of thing that they would ring it up and they'd be like, "Oh, uh, yeah, no, yeah." Right, but it's the machines right? telling me this, so yeah, I guess so. Okay, well, if that's all you got on Redlands, let's hear what. Or we already heard what Jewel has to say about it. <laughs> well, there's also the bands from there. What bands? Death Star is from there. Okay. Sleeping Giant is from there. Okay. Just a few hardcore bands. They're good. Yeah. Well, it seems like an interesting place. It's a lot more... Uh, like There's older architecture than I would have imagined. Yeah, I never saw really I mean, any of this stuff. Because you hear that we are... Visiting a, a small building behind the library. What was that library called? I didn't write it down. It's called the AK Smiley. But in my head, <laughs> I refer to it as the AK-47 Smiley yeah. <laughs> Library. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The AK-47 Library. And really, it's, it, it is an odd thing that there is a Lincoln Shrine... In Redlands, it's California. It's very, yeah, it's interesting. And it was a, uh, it was. I think it's the memorial. That's right, to his son who was killed in World War One. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, it is a parade as well. As you heard, there is a parade of Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, and Brownies. Right. Didn't hear any Eagle Scouts in there, so I didn't. But I, there was something I was hoping. Well, I wasn't hoping for this, but to maintain symmetry, mm-hmm. wouldn't have been fitting if there was a Chinese person pulling a rickshaw with the, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just with the Boy Scout on the back to even it up, yeah, yeah, or just pulling the person holding a flag or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. No, there's no rickshaws. It's just people. It really is just a parade of a bunch of kids holding American flags, yeah, just using their Chevrolet legs. There you go. <laughs> and the uh, the the parade uh, ends up at the the Lincoln Shrine, and Huel goes in, and he's wearing that denim shirt that he's worn on a lot of these early episodes. That lends me to believe that this could have been a video log, which I'm not sure. It. I'm sure it's the same shirt. He has the same shirt. Yeah. I mean, this is his fancy getup. Mm-hmm. Because he's wearing a tie, which he doesn't do that often. That, But the denim double pocket, double yeah. front pocket, Yeah, it's a rare setup. Yeah. Could it be a bugle boy? <laughs> <laughs> but he talks to one of the patrons at the... Because they're having a... After the parade, it's kind of like a, a get-together, a community celebration. And the first lady... He talks to exclaim. Well, he asks why Lincoln, and she says, "Because he's a wonderful man." As if, how dare you question <laughs> the Almighty Lincoln or the Immortal Lincoln, which is on the front of the facade there? 
But then there's this next lady. <laughs> she, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how would you describe her? Well, she's just a, a lady with red hair, wearing she hold... oh. a Shih Tzu sweater. 3D. Yeah, it's like em- yeah. embossed embroidery. And she says that she's a fan of Lincoln, even though she's from the South. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long Maybe. time. Later. <laughs> it right. was a funny. Uh, it was a funny little exchange. Shul never broke character. He just stayed, just smiling and nodding, no matter what she said. Which, what else can you do? Well, he could have said, "I'm from the South too." <laughs> I guess you're right. <laughs> so. So then Huell gets a little tour of the place by Don McHugh, who is an archivist. And one of the first things that Huell runs up to is some more swords. You know how bad he wanted to reach through that glass. That's the only thing that stopped him is that they are behind like a locked cabinet door. I was hoping that he would jiggle the... He's <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I... Up in Marysville, or Mary Moneyville, I was, I was holding all kinds of swords. Clonk! <laughs> but oh, no, man. Don doesn't open the door. I feel like we can't see Huel's eyes, but when he's looking... What was the uh, archivist's name? Don. Don McHugh. Don. I feel like when he's looking at Don, what do you think? Do you think his eyes are just... just oh, yeah. <laughs> he's not really paying attention to the swords. Uh, I want to play with them. But then uh, I guess their their big item that they have is a letter written by and signed by President Lincoln. And it's funny because this is like a big deal because these are kind of rare. And they're, he was like bragging about the subject matter, which is really kind of, you know. This is this is the kind of historical stuff that, as historians, you like hope to find this more personal stuff. Mm-hmm. And what this is is a letter that Lincoln wrote to a friend, complaining about his wife. <laughs> he's complaining about how Mary Todd spends too much money, and so he's going to have the comptroller of the current. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> oh man, but yeah, it's it's on executive mansion letterhead. It's it's a cool thing, and they're very proud of it, and I get it. I hope it's been uh, used as a primary source in an article. I'm sure it has. Book. Do you notice these mur- murals up here? Yeah. You know what? I didn't... <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what can we say about it? Um, just, just say it, dude. It's a wardrobe malfunction. There... <laughs> Because this is supposed to be one of the, the what seven characteristics? Yeah, yeah. They're that he these, exhibited. They're like these uh, female figures that are holding things that represent the different characteristics of Lincoln: wisdom, justice, strength. Uh, strength one just has like a dress on. Uh, justice. Justice. Uh, wisdom. Her dress fell down. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, and it's not a picture. No, it's it was purposefully done it was that way. This way, so she's buff too. It's real buff. It's weird. Well, like the, why is they're all kind of buff? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Uh, well, I think Don was mentioning they got more than they bargained for. Yeah, when they had the, they commissioned the person to to paint it, but it's it's going to stay up there. So. Well, I don't think that the Pope at the time was expecting Michelangelo to paint what he did in the Sistine Chapel, but I think he was probably pleasantly surprised when he saw what he got. Yeah. Who knows what uh, like, oh. the city <laughs> leaders of Redlands were thinking when they saw this. But That's, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, so when we go to the next bit, we go to what Huell describes as a shrine mm-hmm. and the bust of... Abraham Lincoln with bedhead (laughs) (laughs) is there. And Don, he sort of smacks down some some people who think that this is where Abraham Lincoln is buried. Yeah, he said that when kids do their uh, 
their field trips and stuff that they think, oh, this is where he's buried, huh? Yeah, but he referred to the kid as some joker. <laughs> <laughs> like, you hear you're going to the shrine and you see this big bust and flowers on top of it. Yeah, I and would think so, as too. As a kid, it makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah, so we have some joker coming around thinking he's buried here. <laughs> Blah. All right, Don. Whatever. But it's kind of an interesting thing. You never saw this, right, when you lived there? Not at all. Okay. Well, the festival that they have that kind of honors Lincoln and the the scouts does still happen as well. It happened this past March, like all these festivals, which seems to really tick Huel off. Because <laughs> that's what he's got to complain about at the end of this episode is that you know, this this adventure started with some frustration that there's all these festivals and we can only be one place at one time. Sorry, Huel. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? The problem of existence. Yeah, because like, I don't know how far away they were in time back then, but yeah, these all happen kind of on the same week. Mm. Some on the same weekend. Yeah. So, Huel, I feel your pain. Right. Well, on the outro here... We see the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. Although, on, upon closer inspection, it still has a design to the shirt. Yeah, but it's more subtle. It's, it's more subtle. This is the uh, the quiet mm-hmm. side of the spectrum. Because it's red, but it's like a uh, terracotta brick red. Mm-hmm. It's not a vibrant red, like yeah. that loud yellow shirt <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> but you have the bone-colored pants. Yep, yep. With a, a single pleat. <laughs> Who'd have thought? This is the style, dude. A single pleat. But this kind of wraps up the episode. And once again, we have some atmospheric music playing. And once again, I shazammed it because I figured it had to be something. And you wrote it down. Well, who was it? Uh, it's Thanksgiving is the name of the song. Thanksgiving. It's by Mitch Dalton and Graham D Wild. Okay. DeWild. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Graham DeWild won. Um, but you, you shazammed it. And how many times? 14 times. 14? 14 times. Oh. It has been shazammed. You know, we couldn't even fill a classroom. <laughs> well, maybe at a private school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can't play that song because we don't want to have to pay them money. So you're going to hear, uh, what was her name? Oh, Sylvana. Sylvana Chu, who did the theme at the beginning. Going to play it at the end. It's a pretty good one. You know, it's good. I got to say, though, I, I, I said this on uh, Twitter yesterday. Last week's was really one of my favorites. Well, maybe we can make a custom version of this one. Of California Hero Cup? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll make a custom one with Savannah. Uh And we'll we'll do a mashup. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. No, it'll be done. If you hear it, we did it. If we didn't, I couldn't figure out how to do it. (laughs) I've never done that. But it's it's a very soft one, both last week and this week. And I want to bring up these themes because this isn't going to happen that much longer. Because I was looking ahead and... It still happens for a while, but there's a point when we're going to start recycling. And that's really when I got to like decide how we want to do this because one of them is my ultimate favorite. And it's going to be hard. I don't even want to spill the beans yet. It's that... No. You know the version. Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, when it comes, you're going to know it. I think you will. It's so, so good. But either way... We got some time. We got, we got some time. The themes are a real fun thing, and I hope that we can continue to mix them up and make them be fun. Well, there you go. Yep. So we want to thank you for joining us on episode 19 yeah, yeah. of Fuel's Gold, and we invite you as we continue our search for Huel's Golds. Gold. Vanna, take it away. Each morning at dawn, if birdies sing and everything a sun kissed mist said, don't be late. That's why I can hardly wait. 
over and up 